Well, thank you all so much for joining us for tonight's very special um, uh, virtual author visit. We have uh, two fantastic authors with us tonight. Uh, first up is Cy Montgomery, who's a naturalist, uh, a documentary script writer, and author of 33 acclaimed books of nonfiction for both adults and children, including The Hummingbird's Gift, the National Book Award finalist, The Soul of an Octopus, and the memoir, The Good, Good Pig, which was a New York Times bestseller. Uh, the recipient of numerous honors, including a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Humane Society and the New England Booksellers Association, Cy lives in New Hampshire with her husband, writer Howard Mansfield, and a border collie. And, and she also currently, at least temporarily, has four turtles, from, from what I understand. Uh, Cy's latest book, published uh, on May 3rd, is The Hawk's Way Encounters with Fierce Beauty. Uh, and next up is award-winning novelist uh, Erica Fern uh, Fernsick, uh, uh, who's received glowing critical praise for her literary thrillers, uh, featuring women who face extreme physical challenges in nature, even as they grapple with their own internal struggles. Uh, devoted to authenticity in her craft, Erica spent weeks in the wilderness of Northern Maine as research for her debut novel, The River at Night, which was an indie next pick that the New York Times bestselling author Ruth Ware called raw, relentless, and heart-poundingly real. Uh, for her hair-raisingly vivid follow-up, Into the Jungle, Erica journeyed 100 miles up the Amazon to experience firsthand the lush and perilous Peruvian jungle. And oh, and of course, I've lost, I've lost the rest of your bio, Erica. How terrible is that? Uh, but Erica's, jeez, uh, you know what? Let me pull it up. I actually have it on my screen. Uh, so Erica's uh, latest book is Girl in Ice. Uh, so all uh, 75 of us or so who are watching here live on Zoom, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Erica and Sai for joining us here tonight. And uh, ladies, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Thanks so well, much, Robert, for having yeah, us. What a blast. This is so much fun for me because um, not only am I a big fan of Erica's work, um, we've met each other before. We are friends. I've had the privilege of blurbing her books. And we've been to some of the same exact places. In I know, travels. it's so strange. I, I just can't believe we stayed at the same at different times. We stayed at the exact same lodge in the Peruvian Amazon. And we probably saw some of the same electric eels and tarantulas. I know. <laughs> we saw the same, you know, crazy animals and heller heard the same heller monkeys and saw the same titi monkeys and pygmy owls and all the crazy creatures. But I, I do feel that we are kind of separated at birth. Uh, Cy Montgomery and I, I don't know, just having this, I think that same affinity for feeling a certain way in nature. How would you describe it, Cy? Yeah, I, I think we both, we both love to go adventuring. That's um, right, right. And for me, I kind of su support my hunger for adventure by writing books about these things. Exactly. exactly. Um, but what strikes me, what strikes me about um, all of, of your work, your work is fiction. So yeah. you you aren't bound by just what happened to you. Right. Right. But you do first go experience all of these places. And in Girl in Ice, where you went to the Arctic is somewhere that I have not yet been. And I want to know so much more about it. Although I've got to say um, this really thrilling, scary book. Um, I, I don't think that the, uh, the, the, the Greenland Tourist Bureau is going to necessarily, um, they might have a fatwa out on you. Um, I know. <laughs> So I, I oh, want can you tell us what it was like when you went there to research this book? And then we'll talk about the, the whole wild ideas behind it all. Sure. I mean, I was actually, I did a talk last night and someone said, so, so uh, you read about it, you watched videos about it, you interviewed people about it, like, why did you have to go? And I said, 
well, it's kind of like, you know, New York City. I can read about it. I can look at pictures of pictures of New York City. But unless you're standing, you know, in Manhattan, like surrounded by the New York Cityness of it all, how can you how can you get it? The sounds, the smells, the sensation, how you feel so small or how you feel so enclosed by these buildings. And that you could might say, you know, the same was true when I went to, you know, including the Amazon, of course, you know, unless you go there, it's ugh, hard to describe, but Greenland, um, just the sense of scale. I mean, these, uh, I flew, I flew to Reykjavik and then I flew from Reykjavik, Iceland to Kulusuk, which is on the east coast of Greenland. And then I took small, and I took helicopters and small planes to get to this extremely remote um, place where we camped. And then we went to the ice sheet. We spent some time there mm. um, where there is nothing, by the way. I mean, it's so fascinating to be someplace where there is no, there's nothing and no one. It's just this vastness. I mean, Greenland is, you know, just some quick facts about Greenland. It's a third the size of Canada and only 56,000 people live there. I mean, I know community colleges that have 56,000 people, right? And 20,000 or so live in Nuuk, the, the capital, but the rest are in tiny little villages along the coastline of this massive place. And it's, the ice cap is 1,500 miles north to south, 700 miles east to west, two miles thick. Uh, it's thickest and been frozen for 3 million years. And if this were to thaw, God forbid, the oceans would rise 23 feet. But weirdly, this, this, this island would rise because it's just a bowl, you know, it's this giant ice bowl surrounded by these mountains jutting up. But um, that just sort of gives you the, the physical, but then there's the human and the human is you know it's one thing to again read about a subsistence and hunting culture as you know and another to witness it you know how people have to live what they have to do to survive in fact there's a word um in in greenland in greenlandic for it's called the great necessity it's translated as the great necessity. And it just means what you have to do to survive and what you have to do to survive in a place where the only tools you have are stone, ice and bone basically, is you have to know your environment so well. You know where the animals are, you know the conditions of the ice, everything so that you can survive. Um, and so anyway. Oh man, that's just a little glimpse. <laughs> but it sounds like you know the antimatter universe of yeah. the Amazon, yeah. where you know life is piled thick upon it's life. The opposite. You know, yeah. animals are you animals are crawling on you. <laughs> yes, and you have you know. to stay and you must stay calm, right? And yes, say, right. well, it's just a small scorpion that's not poisonous, I don't think. So it's cool. Oh yeah. Or whatever. I mean, yeah. And even <laughs> yeah, I I remember, you know, tarantulas falling out of trees into the boat and it's like, where's the tarantula? Is the tarantula's in the boat? <laughs> I remember my companion saying, the tarantula can't be in the boat. And that's when we saw the legs crawling up the, <laughs> the They were the in boat. the boat. But oh um, a little while ago, you were, you were talking about um, language, the great necessity. And yeah. um, I, I feel we should tell viewers mm -hmm. what Girl in Ice is about, oh, because it's sure. also about language. And your main character, Val, is a linguist. And yeah. you had to do a ton of research, I imagine, yeah. not just what does it feel like to be in the Arctic, and not just what the people um, do to survive in the Arctic, but you became a scholar of languages. So tell us a little about the, the premise of Girl All right, so, so Girl and Ice, um, as you said, is, so Girl and Ice is about uh, Val, and Val is an American linguist 
who is tasked to go to an extremely remote climate research center off the coast of Greenland, where a girl has been found in a glacier and she thaws out alive, speaking a language no one understands. Now, about eight months before the story begins, uh, Val's twin brother, Andy, who was up at this extremely remote climate research center, ventures out 50 degrees below zero, middle of the night and freezes to that. Now, Val doesn't know if, of course she's shattered, but she doesn't know if he took his own life or if there was foul play up there. So the story begins when Val gets an email from Wyatt, who was one of the only other people up there, uh, another climate researcher saying, we found this girl. We sought her out, she's alive. We don't know how, we don't know why, but she's talking, we don't know what she's saying. We need you to come figure out what she's saying. Um, and immediately Val reads this email and she's like, no way, because Val has her own issues. She has a pretty severe anxiety disorder. She's only comfortable in a few places. Uh, but in the email is a little clip of the girl speaking. She plays that. And she doesn't understand a word, a word that this girl says, but she hears fear and terror and, you know, somebody help me. Um, so the first, for the first time in Val's life, she has to step out and decides to go up to this very remote place at, and figure out what this girl is saying, but also figure out what happened to her brother. So, yeah. So yeah, it's a so thriller, suspense, um, mystery, and I guess the way, how did I think of this crazy story? Well, I was... Let's go back to the painted turtles, which Sai is about to release, and she's going to show them to us. She's going to release them tomorrow. This is very exciting. But anyway, bizarrely, because we are joined at the hip, Sai and I, um, I uh, the, the spark for this story came as 2017. I was walking behind my house, freezing winter day. There was a frozen pond back there, and I saw three juvenile uh, painted turtles, and they were frozen mid-stroke, you know? eyes open I was like they don't look alive but they don't look dead so you know I ran home and I googled you know what can freeze and thaw out just fine and it turns out there's a lot a number of creatures that can do that certain crocodiles can do this um certain wood frogs can do this these painted turtles and other creatures can do this they possess a certain cryoprotein that we do not this cryoprotein, so when you freeze something, it becomes jagged, right? So it, sorry, it must be one of your creatures. Yeah, uh, yeah, Thurber, honey, let's not say that. Come here. Sorry. That's all right. <laughs> your cat probably doesn't do this. <laughs> no, he does, but I, I locked him up. He's like ridiculous. But the ice will destroy a cell. So we do not obviously have these cryoproteins. Uh, but anyway, in, uh, the inspiration came on that day. I thought of a girl in a glacier uh, and I could see her foot and she was running. And my job was to figure out who is she? What happened to her? What is, what is her story? So I just went from there pretty much. <laughs> you, you had to make up a language, essentially. You had I to did. invent a language that doesn't exist. Yeah. I'm in awe of that. How do you in create a language? Well, so I, you know, I have to do a little, just a tiny spoiler here. So the girl is, it turns out she is ancient. Um, and that's why when Val was listening to her, she didn't understand what she was saying, nor could she find any root languages um, that she could find uh, that, 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 corresponded to this girl's language. To create the language, oh, you know, I had a lot of fun. I, I listened to all these Nordic languages, East Greenlandic, West Greenlandic, Norwegian, Finnish, Swedish. I was trying to find like, you know, units of sound and meaning that I could cobble together to create a language that felt really real. You know, it just needed to sound real. I write fiction, you know, I only, and I only needed to sort of it don't need to hit people over the head with it, but just give enough so like it feels real. You know, that's um, one of the ways I love to write. I love to write along the edge of 
what seems real and what isn't. Mm -hmm. I mean, along the edge of, of that, for example, I mean, I think that many people have read the book and said, well, maybe you can thaw people out. And they're not so sure after they read the book that, no, we can't quite do that. Not yet. Um, not, not yet. yet. I mean, we could freeze a, um, an embryo with 120 cells. We have that technology. So, you know, extrapolate that a few years and we'll all be a bunch of ice cubes running around. Can you, can you give us some, some words? Can you speak some of the words that oh you made God. up? I, I think can't just love to hear like any, any word that oh you invented. I cannot remember. Isn't that terrible? I cannot yeah. remember one word. Um, it has been a while since I read my own work. I can't. Well, that's can't. all right. I think all yep. of us would love to go back in time and oh, here's hear one. what our ancestors, what they said, you know, and this is part of the allure, I think, of your book. The, the characters are fabulous and the setting is fabulous. And it's got this very you know, like creepy page turning feel to it. But also it has this yearning that I think we all feel. Mm -hmm. We would love to speak to our ancestors. Right, you know? exactly. And I found some words. Um, oh, great. Stondala is one. Yeah, I'm sorry, uh, I couldn't remember how oh, I didn't know how they were pronounced, but. Oh, Standala, uh, Kanisiak, Vansit. Um, it's, and it's, I wanted to, again, a bit of a spoiler here, but one of the, so one of Val's problems is since there's no base language, she doesn't even know where to begin. There's no artifacts, you know, there's no, you know, uh, you know, written language on stones or whatever lying around for her to to research. So she almost has to act as if she's communicating with a baby. They learn uh, in units of uh, meaning, or uh, and then you know for for uh, numbers, for example, one marble versus a bunch of marbles. But in the end, what she's trying to do is communicate with this very traumatized girl. And the girl, imagine waking up and you don't recognize your clothes. You don't know the people who are around you. Uh, and so this girl did not want to communicate. And it, it's only as the story progresses and the, the girl whose name is Sigrid figures out that unless she communicates, she can't get what she needs to survive. She won't, so it takes two to tango. It takes two to communicate, you know what I mean? So. Once Sigrid figures out she needs to communicate, she starts to communicate in her way. And then she starts doing drawings which communicate what she what she needs and and um, Val has to try to understand um, what it is. Yeah, I, I've just found the deeper you got into this novel, mm. the, the, the more hungry you were to resolve all of the tangled things. And, <laughs> and you're, you're rooting for Sigrid, you're rooting for, for Val. Every single thing seemed um, very real. And, and that brings me to uh, climate change yeah. and um, how, you know, as lovers of nature, climate change, I'm sure you're, you feel exactly the way that I do. I mean, we yeah. can't believe that we're like wrecking the world to the extent that we've wrecked the climate possibly irrevocably i mean that we right. have just a few years um there's these winds in that you talk about in yeah. the novel what yeah. are they called again i mean well i call them i call them ice winds and there's again this is something that so they're the real things are called catabatic winds these are winds that are very severe winds that are caused by changes in barometric pressure and or severe temperature changes. They're very strong and very cold coming off glaciers. Now we don't live on glaciers. We don't feel, we don't take note of them, but on glaciers, they're called pitteracks. And they just shoot down these glaciers. And when I read about those, I thought, 
you know, why not have an element in the book where certain places around the world, uh, these ice winds were freezing people to death really quickly. Um, and I have had a lot of readers write to me and say, oh my God, these ice winds, are they real? I'm like, no, not yet, not yet. Um, but it's interesting you mentioned climate change and climate change anxiety. Uh, I don't know, I mean, my first novel, I think The River at Night, there were some references to climate change, but, uh, and there were much more references to it in Into the Jungle. In this book, and, and you know, a big element in the book that has to do with the plot is, chi is climate change, you know, and, and I do not inject things into my stories just because they're topical, you know, they have to be part of the story. Because you know it's entertainment, and the story needs to work as a whole. In fact, I write these uh, first draft before I even go on the research trips because, again, the story comes the human story comes first. But um, like 10, 15 years ago, I wasn't—I don't know—like I thought about climate change, but not as much as I do now. And I don't know about you, but like every other thought is climate change. Every other, every other thought. And I was going to ask you kind of how you deal with it emotionally. I mean, uh, how do you keep your sort of mental, emotional equilibrium? Someone with your level of, I consider you the greatest living nature writer. I, I guess I'm in awe. all the good ones. I'm just in awe. No, or I do. I do. I do. And, and to be that, to be that, you've got to be deeply, deeply sensitive uh, and also mourning this, uh, as most of us, I think, are. Yeah. So how do you, and how do you also, and another question is, I know you love animals so much, but we have to deal with other human beings <laughs> in order to survive, the right? Part. The animals are the, that's the biatch, right? So how do you balance um, those two elements of your personality. And well, especially. how I deal with climate change and and the catastrophe that's upon us is yeah. the same way that you do by writing. And oh, you know, my, I'm not smart enough to write fiction. I write nonfiction, oh. but um, if it's my it's my hope that people will will save what they love, yeah. and it's it's my hope that. I'm just so in love with this world and its creatures. Yeah. I, I wake up every morning and particularly in the spring, you know, what wakes me up, mm -hmm. my, my husband has a, um, an alarm clock that plays the news, but what wakes me oh. up right now is this wren <laughs> outside. Oh, that, wow. You know, have that wonderful waterfall song first thing in the morning and oh, it's yeah. just it's a, that's wonderful a great way, way to, to describe it. The waterfall. That's a great yeah, way. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's just this, this cascade of crystalline, joyous notes. Mm -hmm. And you wake up and you're like, I'm in this glorious world. I'm happy every morning. Yeah. But because I love the world so much and I love all of creation so much. And I love the creator, no matter what we call her or him or it, so much. It pains me doubly to, to see it being destroyed, though often unwittingly. And I remember as a little child learning that the dinosaurs had gone extinct. And we had nothing to do with that, but I was right. devastated. But then as I began to read, my father would read me stories from the New York Times, and this was in the 1960s. We're about the same age. You're younger, um, everyone. That's why she looks so much better than me. Anyway, <laughs> um, all the Drugs stories in the New York Times that were about animals, and those are the ones he'd read to me, were about how everyone was going extinct because of human overpopulation, human overhunting, human pollution. And I didn't know any human who wanted to kill all the whales. I didn't know any human who wanted to wipe out our national symbol. And yet, unwittingly, we were. And it was then that I decided that instead of being a veterinarian, as I thought mm -hmm. in first grade I might be, I would be a writer and help bring 
to the attention of my fellow citizens how we can help. But I've found in writing, it matters first to make them care and to reconnect us with the rest of animate creation because that connection often gets severed. I think we're born with it. I think, you know, children, children's dreams are all about animals. <laughs> Something comes in and wrecks it. Some, a lot of children buy the lie that is sold left and right, that what matters is money and clothes and, you know, and fame and all the stuff that does that not only doesn't matter, but makes you miserable. And every single wise man and wise woman who has ever lived has told us that, but do we listen? No. But um, I think what really gives all of us true joy is connection, connection with other people and with others in the natural world. So that's, that's kind of how I, how I, I deal with this. I channel my joy. My joy becomes love. Oh, that's great. I send out that love by saying, look at this right. octopus I met. She's fabulous. She's just as interested in you as you are. <laughs> look at this hawk. You know, when you see it's a in color. Oh She's my gosh. The octopus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can I it's, do that? It's, it's easy to help people remember how in love we are with the natural world. And if I think if we awaken that, we can turn anything around. And I write for adults and children, and I, I write for all kinds of media, because I, I feel like, you know, all of us have a hand in saving the world. And what a great thing to do with your life. But children, man. Yeah, you got that with the children. Yeah, I, they are I not admire that you can write for tomorrow. tomorrow. That's a skill all today. on its own. Yeah. And you're, you're reaching them. But, you know, your books, fiction draws in people who might not read my stuff you know? i hope so i hope that's a side effect <laughs> of yeah. you know i'm creating you know this a different kind of entertainment although you know reading this book um you know you use so many elements of fiction here you know there's pacing there's there's, there's, you know, uh, inciting instant building climax, uh, climax resolution. Um, and what you're doing is, I mean, I never thought about, can I just read this two sentences about um, your interaction with raptors uh, and what you say about that. You say, um, and you talk about this certain kind of love, and I wanna hear more about that, of, it's a different kind of love. Anyway, say, for a human to love, this is from her book, The Hawk's Way, for a human to love without expecting love in return is hugely liberating. To leave the self out of love is like escaping the grip of gravity. It is to grow wings. It opens up the sky. So literally in her incised exploration of how raptors perceive the world she's she's found a new kind of love which is i don't know that just struck me that in all the ways that the that these creatures um well just can i say about their eyes i love their eyes but they see so much what is it they see they can see for three miles and their their weight of their eyes so what did it? What is it? I mean, they it's twice um, as much as their brain. Twice as much as their brain. <laughs> and if their eyes, in in proportion to humans, were in proportion to us or whatever, we'd have eyes as big as oranges. Wouldn't that be I, cool? I mean, that was to have eyes as big image, as oranges. <laughs> that image really stayed with me. I thought that was oh my god. Talk about bringing it home. You know, uh, the nothing we can create is more is more magical than that. I mean, that's a weak word, even magical, but um yeah so i think well what a compliment god you're so yeah. great but you know i mean i love i love reading fiction i mostly read nonfiction for work mm -hmm. but when mm -hmm. i read fiction it kind of stretches my mind in another mm -hmm. direction and i i think two things that have affected my own writing and you you teach writing which i don't i mean yeah. I, I would be terrible at it. Um, plus, I don't even know how I do what I do when I think it's kind of freakish that I've managed to write <laughs> one book, much less like 33 books. But um, you, 
not well i was going to say novels and sermons <laughs> are yeah. are two um forms that have influenced my my writing mm -hmm. and for you i was surprised to learn that you did a decade of stand-up comedy <laughs> And I would love forward. to know how this, in, you know, how did this shape or inform or how, how does this help you write these suspenseful, riveting um, novels? Well, you know, when I think about those years, I think, was I wasting my time, you know? Um, but I can't say that it, I had a lot of fun. I had great nights. I had terrible nights. You know, in comedy, you're only as good as your last set. You know, you, you, and, you know, it's a whole other talk to talk about comedy. But um, I learned how to write prolifically. I learned how to deal with rejection. Well, that's for sure. Right. Oh boy. Yeah. If oh you're a writer, boy. you're gonna and get it. I learned how to deal, you know, I've learned how to get to the friggin' point. <laughs> All right. Uh, you know, I learned kind of what people want to hear, and I learned about fear. I learned a lot about fear because I don't care where we went, where you went, what giant snake we wrestled to the ground, what massive iceberg was about to break and you know kill me. Uh, nothing's more frightening than standing on stage and telling a joke and you tell the punchline and then you have to wait. Oh my because, God. Because early in my early days of doing stand-up, I would tell jokes and I was so afraid of the reaction that no one would laugh that I would just keep going. But the audience, it's a conversation you see, and I didn't realize that. And I was afraid of that because, you know, I, it's, it's terrifying, you know? So I learned a big thing about fear and that is that um, I had to wait for the reaction, whatever the reaction might be. Uh, whether it's laughter, silence, whatever it is, I knew that I, because if you don't, the audience senses, feels disrespected. The audience is like a big bear. They just want to love you or kill you. You know what I mean? They're just this big dumb bear. And um, and how does that translate to writing suspense and thrillers? I'm not really sure. I guess one 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 thing is, you know, you, you always have to be aware, as much as you have to get into your world, our world of you know what we're writing, we we do have to remember it's a conversation. You know, it's not about it's never about Simon Montgomery or Erica Forensic. It's about that person absorbing with their unique brain, your unique brain, and what comes out of that? What does come out of that? You know, we can't control it. We can't control our reviews. We can't control our reactions. We can only do the best that we can do. Um, so I don't know how that relates to comedy so much, but. Well, what strikes me when you write, um, when you're talking about how, you know, comedy taught you about fear, and yeah. fear, I mean, you can't just sustain fear for 250 pages. There has to be a break or your poor right. reader is just gonna die. It's gonna be terrible. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and you have to do that. Breaks, yep. And, and your, your, your books are so suspenseful, but it's not so unrelenting that I just can't read this anymore. <laughs> and and you're, you're very, you're clever, fun, um writer and even if we're inside like val's head right the character of val in girl in ice is not necessarily somebody that you would say i really want to be this person's friend i really want to spend mm -hmm. 250 pages listening to val right but you do you, you care so much about this this person and she too has a sense of humor you yeah. know um, well there is there is it's true i mean people say um 
when you're trying to, you're, you're, when you're trying to actually, I mean, you're trying to create life. It should feel like life, just like dialogue. When you write dialogue, you know, early days writing dialogue, I wrote really crappy dialogue because it sounded real. It's like, how are you doing? I'm fine. How are you? No, 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 no one cares. Okay. Dialogue has to be there for a reason, but it has to feel real. So I think that humor, like everything else, like pathos, like grief and everything else is part of our life. And so if it's not there, it feels, ah, it doesn't feel real. Yes, I know I'm in a story, but I, you, you, you know, you need to enter that world, you know, you need to enter that world and every world, every book has its own world and its own rules, you know, um, so, so I guess I, it's, it's, it is a paradox. It's not real life, but it's got to feel like real life, but not be boring because real life is pretty boring. There's all these tedious things, you know, it's like, I did my taxes today. Is that, you know, right. you know it's like, no one cares, you know, entertain me. Entertainment is very, it's a very, entertainment is this very light word, but it's a very heavy word when you think about it. It's doing a very profound thing. It's pulling you, it's pulling you into another world. And how do you do that? That's the skill of the writer. You know, that's the skill of the writer. In the human brain, we need to be, in order to be emotionally healthy, we must have story, we must escape. You know, yeah. absolutely yeah. bottomless Netflix, whatever you're doing, you're getting story, you know, and you're hooked in. You know, you're a journalist. You had to write stories with leads that pulled in the reader, or you were a journalist. I mean, you know, you have that training. Oh, so yeah, yeah, that's exactly what my training was, and that was very, that was very helpful because a, a lot of my stuff, you know, I'm always taking notes and I'm always taking down dialogue and I'm always, um, and it's, you're doing it while you're, you know, walking up the mountain and walk mm -hmm. Rocky Scree it. 11,000 feet in Mongolia and you're, <laughs> no, you're doing ahead. it in the cloud forest while your paper is disintegrating mm -hmm. and you're doing now I I've got to ask you too I mean many people say oh I wish so much I could go with you on these trips and because you know we we write about these adventures with all this exciting stuff happens we're leaving out the boring parts <laughs> I know. A, a whole lot of my travels have been spent just waiting somewhere very I know waiting for a plane a train mosquito bites right? yeah. <laughs> but sometimes crazy stuff happens to you and it never finds its way onto the page but um mm -hmm. i wonder if you would share some one of your crazier adventures that may have inspired something or that you um it might not actually be in one of your novels but that helped you come up with something that went in your novel or um well i don't know if i did think i mean um uh hmm, i mean i guess with the river at night um yeah. i did some pretty crazy so that's a, that novel, I don't have a copy in front of me, but um, it's about four women, friends who go whitewater rafting in Northern Maine in the Allagash territory. They lose the raft and they have to survive, not only the wilderness, but a mother and son who have disappeared themselves for their own tragic reasons. So I needed to go to the Allagash territory of Northern Maine because I needed to do that. And I also needed to talk to people who live off the grid because I never met anyone who really done that so I made all these calls I up and down uh, right up to Fort Kent practically Canada do you uh, these uh, chambers of commerce do you know someone who lives off the grid I need to they're like they live off the grid they don't want to talk to you you know what I mean so <laughs> and how I do you like, find them oh tell I just them pushed and pushed and pushed them. I called them friends of it friendly I had like seven interviews set up and of, and of course six of them were single men oh great really safe well, great. yeah good yeah, yeah. So, uh, and our poor husbands, right, Cy? We tell oh, them, boy. well, honey, I'm going to go to Alaga. <laughs> and so, but I vetted all of them. But the one that was the most sort of frightening even for me was, uh, and I and I kept pushing this trip off because I was afraid of it or something. And I ended up, so I ended up, made it the worst thing possible. I went in the middle of winter in Maine <laughs> is when I went, right? <laughs> I know. I had headaches. 
I you're bad. <laughs> so this one guy, I was told it was perfectly safe, very weird, but perfectly safe. He said, I'll only talk to you if you meet me. And there's only like one road when you get up there. There's nothing. Yeah, I'm talking about. Uh, he said, I'll meet you at mile marker 156. I'll be on my horse. Park your car and we'll go into the woods on my horse. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so I met him at mile marker 156 and he did not want anyone to learn where he lived or anything. So he had me sign this carbon coffee, carbon coffee. Remember carbon coffee? Oh yeah. Oh my and God. I will not disclose. Blah, blah, blah. And I was like, signed it and gave it to him. Got on his horse and off we went to his very weird, weird cabin in the woods where he gave me a nice meal and then we were done and he got on the horse and got back. But I mean, you know. I got to ask, what did he feed you? Was it like a groundhog or something? <laughs> it was like, it was a stew. It was oh, um, boy. A, a venison <laughs> stew. Yeah. And it's extremely drafty cabin with these skins hanging. Wow. My yeah. God. But oh, um, yeah, and that's. But how so lovely, it, you know, that you got to go inside this person's house. I that, did. That's one of the things I've loved in my travels too. Right. You know, I've everyone been, had different reasons for doing it. I was expecting everyone to have the same reason. They were all different, but yeah, you got to meet the people, right? Sai, all over the world. Tell me one of your stories, one of your adventures that surprised you somewhere. Oh boy, well, they all do. I mean, going into these houses is really great, isn't it? Um, I've been in like. Um, I don't know what they bought the Batwa um, who live in what was Zaire when I was there, which is now Congo. These yeah. are um, what we used to call pygmies. They're, mm. they're sh very short people. And the minute you go in the forest with them, you realize why, because you keep getting hit in the head with a branch right here and what? they're going right underneath. Oh my it's like, God. It's like wow. why am I so gangly and awful? And I'm five foot five and I was this horrible giant. And they had these lovely little shelters of leaves that to me wow. looked much like um, a gorilla's night nest, but turned upside down. And then I've been inside of people's dares. They're um, the, the movable um, tents that nomadic people uh, mm. stay in in Mongolia. And those, they're, they're gorgeous. And we had a gear that we stayed in when I was doing a book on snow leopards. Um, and every time I would go to someone's house, this, this was funny because I've been a vegetarian for like 40 years and they're such generous people in Mongolia. They're so welcoming. And the minute you yeah. show up, they want to welcome you by with, like a barnyard holocaust. <laughs> they want to kill everything because you're there. And I mean, no, I don't want to take their meat away from them. I certainly yeah. don't want to eat it. So the translator had to explain to everyone yeah. we met right away, like she has a terrible disease and she eats nothing but leaves. <laughs> <laughs> and but did you drink, did you drink yak milk? I did. I drank what yak milk, that? which was great. My, my um, companion, the photographer, Nick Bishop was a little worried about it for getting like, oh, brucellosis or tuberculosis or some osis right, of some right. kind, but uh, I sucked that right down. The yaks were wonderful. They were some of the greatest animals that we saw. They looked like they were wearing these flowing robes because their 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 fur you, you almost don't see their mighty legs and hooves because of the their fur that just flows down. They're gorgeous, gorgeous animals. Um, and most of the livestock in Mongolia lives wild almost all the year. And when they wow. need something from that animal, they go out and, and get them. But most of the time they live, you know, the, the life of, of Riley. It's, it's pretty great. I've found, you know, people have been so welcoming around the world. And it's been lovely for me to see how plastic the, human, the, the humans' lives can be, how we can thrive in so many different environments yeah, yeah i mean the, the fact that yeah i mean the fact that 
these people can survive in Greenland, this Inuit culture on, oh man. Well, you know, and with nothing basically. So. Yes, and have done mm -hmm. so for, for aeons. For which eons. Is, and no one had anything but, but bone and stone and- And I mean, they invented they, kayaks. I mean, Greenlanders invented the kayak with, they made it with whale ribs and caribou skins and they sewed their anoraks so perfectly to each hunter that no water got into these, uh, these vessels. Um, of course, that was a woman's job. So a good, good woman was a great seamstress and she could create these, you know, custom suits. Um, but yeah, it's crazy. But Robert, we see you. Does that mean it's Q&A? I think it's time for some audience questions. We okay. have about uh, 10 minutes left and we have about 10 okay. audience questions. Okay. Um, so uh, I'll combine some. Um, okay. So... Uh, and, uh, let's see, Irene asks, how does Sai decide what creature to write about in her next book? That was and, one of my questions. Yeah, and Jennifer <laughs> asks, what gives you the inspiration and motivation for the topic or location for your books? Uh, or why do you pick a particular animal? So I guess the bottom line that, uh, Erica, how do you determine the locations of your books? And um, Sai, how do you uh, determine your animals? Well, I'm, I'm real quick with that. I mean, for me, the story comes first and the locations, I'll, I want a challenging location. Uh, I mean, I want the location to fit the story. I did have that sort of idea of a girl in a glacier. I didn't have that many choices, really. Antarctica, Greenland, a few other places. Um, but really, the story comes first and so on. But I want to hear what uh, Sai has to say about that. Well, in the beginning of my career, I was very strategic about what I, what I wrote. The, my first book was an homage to my, um, my heroines, Jane Goodall, Diane Fossey, and Bertha yeah. Haldicas. And I wrote a book mm -hmm. called Walking with the Great Apes that's still in print about how their relationships with their study animals are what gave them insight into the behavior of humankind's closest relatives that no one had had ever had before. And from there, I picked um, predators next because I saw mm -hmm. that our relationship with predators was a, a troubled one. But then at that point, books started presenting themselves to me. When I was mm -hmm. in Indian Bangladesh in the Bay of Bengal, I saw these river dolphins some of which were pink and found out that there were river dolphins in the Amazon. And that led me mm -hmm. to the Amazon. In the Amazon, I met a man who had seen this peculiar bear he couldn't identify in China. And that led me to search for the golden <laughs> moon bear. And you know, I was giving a presentation about my Amazon book and met a woman who was studying um, tree kangaroos in Papua New Guinea and so on and so on and so on. So um, in some cases, I'm thinking it out very carefully. Soul of an Octopus was one of those that I thought out very carefully, mm -hmm. that I waited until I felt that I finally was smart enough uh, to tackle trying to get into the mind of a marine invertebrate yeah. and, and tackle consciousness. So, And the book I'm working on now is a book like that, that I've thought of very carefully and um, it's about turtles and about time. Wow, mm. turtles and time. Interesting. Uh, Patricia in the chat says, I'm so glad that you're friends and fans of each other. What a rich presentation. And Andrew asks, how did you two meet each other? How, how, how long have you known each other for? Well, I'm this, you know, blushing fan here. And I was, I, I don't know how I just stumbled over her books and I started reading one after the other. And I live in Framingham and I just saw, okay, she's speaking in Harvard Square. Go, you idiot, you know? <laughs> so, you know, I was so, I was thrilled to learn that, you know, she's local to me. And um, really it was just that. I mean, just, I just- yeah, we hit that, it off uh, right away. I mean, I knew right yeah. away when I met you, like, oh, this is my people, you know? <laughs> Yeah. Um, little did we know how much we had in common, though. That I know. I'm still, I mean, every time we talk or email, I'm like, no, <laughs> get out. I know, be. I know, I know, I know. It's quite bizarre. Even our childhoods are quite similar, which is 
very strange. Yeah, I know. And I and think some of the of some of the way we write uh, is in reaction to that too. And 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 going to this place as a place, nature as a place of comfort and sanctuary for from a troubled background, if I may say. So Helen has a question, a uh, different question for each of you. Um, Helen would like to know, Erica, how long did it take to research and write Girl in Ice? Um, so mm, probably research is constant, by the way. I, the minute I get an idea, I start, I start reading book after book after book after book. So it's all during the process. Um, I had the idea, I take about six months to write an outline. My outlines are very important to me. My outlines are long and detailed, 100 pages or so. Then I write a first draft, and then I write the final draft, and then I go on the trip. So to answer your question, probably like two, two and a half years altogether. Oh, great. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you. And mm -hmm. uh, Helen, uh, for, uh, Helen asks, Sai, uh, what can we do to make the environment safer and better for hawks and other birds of prey? Ah, well, great question. One, uh, one is to, uh, is so easy, but it involves not doing stuff even. Um, birds of prey, the, I recently released a healed um, broadwing hawk who had nearly died from eating a rodent who'd been poisoned, um, poisoned with rodenticide. And people don't even realize, you know, I've got, I've got some mice, I call them the exterminator. They don't realize that those mice are gonna stagger outside and be an irresistible treat for, for a lot of different animals. But hawks, of course, are gonna see it from a mile away and it's gonna be yeah. an easy thing to catch. And so one, don't, don't do that. Um, mm -hmm. and another is, you know, just, birds of prey are persecuted. Um, we need strong laws and to enforce them so that people do not shoot them, do not trap them, do not poison them. Um, and everything facing any problem in the wild is facing a, a problem that we're causing by our actions. So every time we, we leave the plastic at home, um, Every time we take a bicycle instead of a car, every time we buy a Prius instead of a Subaru, every time, you know, every time we choose life and to preserve life, we're, we're helping birds of prey. If you support your local um, bird rehabilitator, that directly helps birds of prey. A lot of times they're hit by cars and they can, they can be saved, but it's a long, difficult process. Uh, Karen says, thank you both for an uplifting and enjoyable talk. I love your enthusiasm and passion thank for you. your work. You. Donna says, amazing, adventurous, and fascinating women. Thank you for this incredible evening. Uh, Carol notes, uh, this one's for Cy, uh, the Boston Globe dubbed you part Indiana Jones and part <laughs> Emily Dickinson. There you uh, go. Is that a fair assessment, Cy? <laughs> it depends on which part you're taking. <laughs> Oh, actually, you know, I, I know who wrote that. It, it was someone who's now a dear friend and, and also an adventure woman and a best-selling author. It's um, my, my friend, Vicki Constantine Croak. So um, she, she has a great way with words and I was very honored when she said that. Uh, we'll take uh, two more questions. Uh, this one came up a couple of times. I'm gonna ask it, this is again for Cy. Uh, Sai, have you ever met a creature you didn't like, uh, or is there, or, or do you have a favorite? Uh, your exuberance and appreciation for all living things is absolutely wonderful. Oh, bless you. Well, I wasn't thrilled with the dozens of leeches that were <laughs> sucking my blood after I got back from my first day thrashing around the Queensland rainforest, but um, I, I didn't put salt on them or anything. I just took a shower, and then they went down the drain and I wish them well. So um, yeah, leeches I'm not crazy about. I'm not crazy about the mosquito that gave me dengue fever in Borneo. Oh God. Um, uh... Yeah, dengue's, dengue's uncomfortable. Dengue's but serious, you know, man. you can die from it. And I figured, you know, 
my, my friend Diane Taylor Snow was with me at the time and we didn't know it, but she had hepatitis and I had dengue. And we both were very ill and we got out of Borneo and we got as far as Singapore and we checked into this flop house and we said to each other, you know, if you wake up and I'm dead, you call my husband. If I wake up and you're dead, I'll call your husband. So write down their phone numbers. And then we went unconscious for like three days. And then we woke up and said, let's go find a Denny's and have a milkshake. And we did. <laughs> that milkshakes cure everything. I have a question if you run out, Robert. Oh, oh, well, uh, my my last question was going to be um, just any general uh, advice uh, you both have for aspiring writers, um, maybe maybe just briefly. Um, yeah. And I'll that, that, that sort of incorporates a couple of questions we got. Carol, right. Carol was specifically interested in how do you come up with the first line for your book? Ugh. Well, um, the quick advice I have is uh, my first book was published, I was, I was 57, okay? I've tried for 35 years and I never gave up. So it's persistence and it's, and it's being passionate about it. I mean, you, don't make yourself miserable. If you don't like writing, like don't do it. Uh, but if you love it, be persistent and be open, learn. You've got to learn. Um, and so that's my advice. Um, what was the other part of that question? I'm sorry, Robert. Well, and then Carol's very specific question was, how do you come up with the first line for your oh, book? Oh, the first line. Okay, I'll answer that real fast. I, I just, it's very painful because the first line is like, you've got a blank page, you know? And so you just say something, even if it's bad, and you, change, and you end up changing it 500 times anyway. So my question for Sai is, and yes. she has to answer the other one too, yes. when are you happiest? researching, writing, or on publicate, publishing, publishing day? Or are there parts to that that are, yeah, that's a question. Oh, research. You have to ask, answer the question about writing first. I guess. Yeah, well, oh gosh. Um, that's a lot, but anyway. You know what I would say is, is very important if you wanna be a writer and you wanna be a writer like full time is mm. just don't develop expensive habits. Yeah, <laughs> because that's the most reading. important not needing a bunch of crap, you know, not yeah. needing a bunch of stuff gives you freedom and gives you time. And it's my time husband and I are both full-time freelance writers. There's very few people who are, you know, didn't have sense enough to marry like a doctor or an engineer or a computer for somebody <laughs> who brings in a regular paycheck. But my husband and I both do this and we've done it since we were in our twenties. So, um, and I think, yeah, it matters if you have talent and you work hard and all that kind of stuff, but a big part of it has been that this has been the most important thing to us and we don't let anything else get in the, in the way. Got it. Yeah. So, and first line, I, I, same thing. It's very intimidating thinking of the, of the first line, but you just got to start writing. And just sometimes do the story will just take you. Just, it's going to suck, you know, really. Just say something and then something has to follow it. And then you know, <laughs> you'll, 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 go, you'll go back and don't, don't worry so much about it. Yeah. So uh, Erica and Sai, uh, as we wrap up, do either of you have any last words for the audience? Well, thanks mine. for coming. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it, this has been a wonderful opportunity and thank you for providing the opportunity and yes. being friends with us. I mean, I, yeah. I, I feel like um, this has been such a, a fun, intimate um, friendship. And I hope everyone who listens feels embraced by this friendship. Yes. And who, and, and feels inspired by maybe their writing journey or their relationship to the natural world and also knows that you know we're, we're always ever one person and what Sai was saying it was like it's easy to be overwhelmed but if we each do what we can you know it's, it's going to add up and it has to so right. take some peace in that take some comfort in that I think that's 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 how I get to sleep at night, you know. Well, <laughs> great. 
Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Erica. Thank you so much, Sai. Yeah. A wonderful presentation as expected. I want to thank the libraries in uh, North Andover, North Reading, Georgetown, Danvers, Andover, Gorica, Wilmington, wow. uh, oh, nice. um, for partnering with us uh, for tonight's program. Uh, and for those who are watching live, uh, please look for an email from me tomorrow uh, with links to purchase copies of the book, a link to a feedback survey and a link to this recording. So thank you all so much, and I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their evening. Thank you, Erica. Thank Have you, Have a si. lovely evening. Thanks. Have a good night. Bye. Bye-bye.